Welcome to the Inside Carolina podcast. It is the post-game podcast. Carolina goes down to Miami and goes down to Miami in a big way. With the post-game means I've got Dewey Burt with me. I'm host Tommy Ashley. we got Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com sponsoring us. Dewey, um, right before we went on air, I asked, were there any positives? Because I don't know of any. Maybe the freshman got a few minutes of action. Um, don't know if that qualifies as a positive in this one, but Carolina loses 85 to 57 in a game that I'm not sure I've seen the first half as bad for Carolina basketball in a long, long time. I'd have to search some memory banks that I don't know still exist. What was your take? Yeah, nothing, nothing real positive to, to say about that I mean I you know I thought in the first half we actually got some decent looks offensively we just shot the ball extremely poorly and then obviously they made everything which means we weren't guarding I mean, we did a poor job on the pick and pops allowing the big fellow for them to get open look after open look Long got every shot he wanted uh so did McGusty you know so they were superior athletically from the perimeter they finished they made shots they shared the ball and like I said, I, I thought we got good looks in the first half. We just didn't make any of them. I mean, after Brady made, uh, I think, his first two, you know, just there was a lid on it. And so a game that got out of hand, you know, probably still would have been a 10, 12, 14 was 30 because in addition to being listless defensively, we also shot the ball extremely poorly and turned the ball over. Yeah, I mean, when Manic came out, I think he hit the first one for sure. Carolina was up 5-2, I believe, and then just sort of turned sideways. It, there's nothing – I don't know if there's anything you can draw out of the tape um, except for this. Carolina has been beaten by teams that are superior athletically and worn out by teams that execute that are superior athletically. I think Carolina's got talent. Sherell McMillan, hat tip, I love him. He thinks Carolina's talent's top 10, top 15 in the country. But athletically, they just don't have it there, and Miami took advantage of it. What can Hubert Davis do, if anything, to offset that against teams that are going to play like Miami did? I don't know. I mean, try, try some zone, uh, perhaps, which we haven't seen. Um but I think the most disappointing thing about the way we defend it is we know Wong and McGusty are their best players and those guys got every shot they want. We didn't take them out of what they like to do in any way. They got rhythm. Uh, they used their athleticism to get to the rim. They got open looks. We went under ball screens on guys that were continuously making shots. We, as we said, you know, poorly played the pick and pop to allow the big guy to catch and shoot and get in rhythm. Um, so yeah, so, you know, he could have gone to his bench maybe earlier to try to get more life out of him before it got out of hand or, you know, we're used to seeing coach sub five in for, and five out because he's upset with guys and Hubert hasn't done that. Um, but yeah, we had no answer for them on the defensive end. They got every shot they wanted and, uh, you know, we really didn't put up much of a fight and. You know, when the announcers are talking about the fact that Hubert is continually having to coach effort, it's an issue. I mean, that's something that we've talked about here and he shouldn't have to do. And whether or not your coach is a great motivator or not, and I'm not saying he is or he isn't because I don't know, I can't know, you shouldn't need motivation to play and wear that jersey. And we just, I didn't see a lot of emotion out of guys. Like I, that, that's part of the, the alarming piece is like, you're getting blown the hell out. And I just didn't see much emotion. Like, I don't know if that was acceptance or this is just a different type of group, but I just, I didn't, we never got blown out like this, but if we had, I, you know, I, I know how some of our guys would have reacted. That's a, that's a great point there. And I was trying to find the tweet by Brian Ives. I was going to read it here in a second, but, you would think down 30 and the guys are basically punking you a little bit. Miami, I thought Miami was trying to show them up. You might catch a foul. You, you might put somebody on their back at some point. It didn't seem like Carolina was much interested. The only guy that ended up on his back was Baycott there late um, trying to make a play. 
um, trying to help somebody on defense. Um, let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask it because I – I'm interested to know if, if the yo-yo effect that this team has, play great at home, play terrible on the road, um, have shown they – I mean, they beat Georgia Tech on the road, but that's Georgia Tech. What's the disconnect? Is it a, is it a coaching issue? I mean, why is there such a big difference in the level of play night in and night out? Somebody's – the message boards and the fans are looking for somebody to blame. Where does it lie? in your opinion well it, look the message boards i didn't i didn't look at them or i haven't looked at them yet they're going to blame hubert and and i understand it's frustration so you're going to blame the coach and everything um but he, here's my answer to that there isn't any way he prepared he and the staff prepared them any differently for this game than they did for the georgia tech game than they did for some of the other games where we've played well. Whether the opponent's good or not, you, you still prepare the same way. So what, what is it that causes our guys to come out the way they did in this game versus how they did against Michigan, let's say, right? Now, I understand Michigan, their record's not great. They're not that good. But when we played them, that was a big marquee game, and they were a big-time team, and we came out with energy defensively. We were active. We were in passing lanes. We were, we were a completely different team on the defensive end than what we just watched. And so it's hard for me to put the blame solely on the coaching staff when you don't like change your preparation completely from game to game. Like you generally, you get it, you do the same things, right? You get into a flow like, this is how we prepare. This is how we watch tape. This is what we're going to do. This, this is how we scout opponents. This is what the scouting report looks like. This is what we talk about. These are the tendencies of your opponents. These are the things we've got to focus. Like that stuff is the same. The opponent changes, but the preparation timeline is the same. And then, and then they play completely differently, you know? So I, I, I understand getting on them, you know, you want them to adapt. You want them to try zone. You want them to play the freshman. Okay, fine. But like for us to come out and in the first eight minutes play like that, I, I it's hard for me to blame the coaches on that. I don't understand how the players can have such a different level from game to game. That's hard for me to understand and hard for me to blame entirely on the coaches. What was the difference for you guys? Uh, clearly going on the road, but it, the mentality when you were there um, and all those guys used to talk about stealing brownies and taking yeah. names on the road it just seems like for this team the last few years this year especially is i mean is it that big a difference to be away from home as a college basketball player as a college athlete is, is it, it can, can you play at home what 72 hours ago with such high energy and all that go on the road and just lay an egg is it simply being away from home or is it something else I, I can't, I can't say that that would make sense to me. I mean, you know, I don't know if there's something to, this is a, a theory and it's going to sound like an excuse, but I don't know if there's something to these half empty arenas and COVID and just the, the road, the road uh, atmosphere being somewhat dead. I don't know. Cause we never had that. I mean, when, wherever we went, whenever we played, I mean, that place was rocking. They were, they were on us from the time we went out on the court an hour before tip because we were the biggest game of the year for them. And so that energy, you felt it and you got this kind of vindictive way about you. Like, oh, we're going to ruin their night. We're going to ruin their effing night. And that's how we always felt. And, and that also came from our head coach. Uh, he loved playing on the road. I mean, he loved it. I can't, but Hubert probably does too. I don't know. I've never been in that locker room. That's a little bit of a different thing here, but we just had a way about us that uh, you almost relished it. it. It was almost, it was harder on the road. So you even got up for it a little bit more. Um, that's how, that's how our teams work. Um, so you know, it's just a different, a different time. And maybe it is that half empty arena feeling, which is 
kind of sleepy and I, I don't know. I, obviously I'm reaching here, but uh, uh, something's got to change. The, the pride has to be there when you wear that Jersey, whether it's white or it's blue, it shouldn't matter. You know, you only get so many times to put it on and uh, it, they didn't play like it mattered to them tonight. Yeah. And unfortunately that's not the first time this season that has happened. I mean, it's happened multiple times. Brian eyes tweeted, uh, back at the end, the 27 point halftime deficit matches the largest deficit over 25 seasons for Carolina. They were trailing um, at Duke by 27 in 2010, the last Carolina team not to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, where do you go from here? Hubert said after Tennessee, that's the last time my team will play with that kind of effort or that lack of effort. And here we are three times since then. We're as, put yourself as a coach, and I hate to do this to you, but put yourself as a coach and then put yourself as a player since you were in the arena. Um, how do you move forward? What do you have to do to move forward? Carolina plays at Wake Forest this weekend. Wake Forest not a bad team. Wake Forest will do the same thing Miami did if Carolina's not careful. Do it for me. Coach and roll player role yeah i mean for for hubert maybe you try something you haven't tried you know i don't i don't get the sense that he's a screamer that he really lays into those guys and um certainly uh certainly coach williams was and would get on us and would lay into us and had no problem doing that and and then you you added to that that you wanted to do well for coach Williams because you cared about the man. Right. So he was able to not take advantage of that, but, but able to, to utilize that additional motivation that, that you felt as a player, you wanted to win for him also and your teammates and the, the, and the Jersey and the school and all those things. And, and I believe that Hubert has that too. I believe these kids want to win for him, um, but he might have to figure out a different way to message it. Uh, because, because this, that, you know, like nights like tonight just don't, don't work. And then for the players, you know, and we've talked a lot about, we don't know if there's a, a true emotional leader for this team. Um, I mean, if we ever played like this, which we never did, but if we ever played like this, I can't imagine what David Noel would have said to us at halftime. I can't imagine. He probably would have fought you too. Um, yeah. And I mean, he would have challenged, challenged your manhood, all those kind of things. And, you know, but, but he had earned that right, Tommy. I mean, he had won a ring the year before. And, and so if David Noel got in your face and challenged you for not playing hard enough, which again, we never had to do, we lost, we, we made dumb mistakes. We were young. We, you know, didn't execute we lost three out of four at some point in that year 2005 2006 but we never we never didn't play hard um so who on this team has earned the right to get in the face of the other guy and challenge their heart is it baycott i think it could be somebody tweeted that told probably him, he's but... the one Somebody said Baycott's the Sam Howell of the basketball team. I can take yeah, that several I mean, ways, but is is Baycott that guy? He's he's the one who's earned it the most, certainly. I mean, the way he's his numbers justify him doing that. It doesn't seem to me that's his personality. Uh, I don't know him well. I've watched him play pickup, um, but it doesn't seem to me that's his personality. That's his personality. So who's the emotional leader of the team that calls the players only meeting? We have players only meetings, you know, guys, even, I mean, it make it's easy to say now it makes sense now. And I'm not trying to stir something up by bringing up this name. I'm solely making this point because that he was a captain of our team. But when West Miller called a players only meeting in 2006, 2007, and him and Rayshon were our leaders, and he spoke, and Bobby Frazier spoke, now a coach, uh, and even Tyler would speak, uh, and Marcus would speak, that, you know, ca that carried weight 
And, and so now you say, oh, well, of course, Wes did. He's a coach. He was born to be a coach. He always had that in him. But back then, he was just our teammate. So who calls a players only meeting on this team? I don't know. I mean, I hope someone does that and says, guys, you know, legacy matters. The family matters. Do you want to you want to be one of the teams that they talked about not, you know, representing the way we're supposed to play when we come back in the summers? You don't, you don't want to be a part of that. So who who has those conversations? You know, I don't know. I agree with you. That's what they got to figure out. And if it is a player doing it now, uh, they need to step up more. Carolina just goes to Miami and gets just – I mean, you could have turned it off, like you said, at eight, eight minute of the eight-minute mark of the first half, and you'd seen it all and seen enough. Carolina doesn't show up down in Coral Gables. Do we appreciate you joining me? I mean, it seems like we always talk when it's an ugly, an ugly ball game, but hopefully we can get together with, with a positive one. I, you know, this Carolina team can be good. But if they're not going to shoot it well and they're going to play um, with lack of effort and intensity and energy, whatever you want to call it, on the defensive end, this happens against a team like Miami. Props to Miami for making them pay for showing up like that. I mean. Yeah, look, Miami, Miami played well. They made shots. They got in rhythm. Um, look, I'm not going to give up on these kids. You know, we're still, still going to support them, still going to watch them. Still going to send positive texts to the to the right people and and hope they they find a way because trust me as upsetting as it feels for guys on the message boards or people that say oh, I've been following for fifty years nobody feels worse than the guys in the locker room nobody and it's not close Coach Williams used to talk about he's got more desire in his pinky than all the fans combined. The point he was making, guys, they're the ones that invest all this time. We turn the TV on at seven and we watch and we complain and we're pissed and we say it ruins our night. They're the ones that invest hours and hours and hours. And so nobody feels worse than them. And that emotion of how bad they feel, now it needs to translate to something. It needs to, to move them in a way that they don't play like they played tonight. Yeah, well said there. I agree 100% with you. Dewey Burke, former North Carolina Tar Heel. Appreciate you investing time to come on these podcasts. I know it's uh, it takes time and effort and energy for you to, to get with us, um, but I always appreciate it. It's always fun talking. Thanks, my man. Thanks, Tommy. Special thanks to Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com for sponsoring Inside Carolina. Rate us, review us, subscribe, all that good stuff. We'll be back on the next Inside Carolina podcast on the beat live Thursday night. If you're around, check us out on our YouTube channel. Peace.